<laughs> but she's ready to go right now. Thank you, sir. All right. Exodus 14. First word. If I see that first word in Exodus 14, what is it? And. That means that this is a continuation of chapter. Then when you study the Word of God, where chapter divisions and verse divisions are, does not mean that God is done with the subject. So a lot of people, they just take one at a time and just cut everything else off. What you do, you lose your context. If you're not careful, make sure that's on you, you will get out of your context. When you pull a verse out of its context, then it can become a pretext at that point in time. So what we have to do is interpret it then. So when you got that in, and I, we'll just read verse one, and all the congregation, aren't you glad they were on, in one accord? And then you can be in one accord and we're on the accord, all right? Somebody said that was the first mention of an automobile uh, in the Bible. They were all in one accord in the New Testament. It's a Honda Accord, so they were in one accord, but in a wrong way. Now, look what he said. It was, all the congregation lifted up their voice and started, oh, boy, that's a murderous, complainingest outfit that ever was, and God loved them. Man. I, I go back to the Corinthian church, and I'll, pro I'll probably deal with that this morning. I've got two or three things that's buzzing up here, and I'm not sure which direction I'm going to go this morning. Uh, but at the same time, boy, a bunch of gripers, complainers, and the people wept that night. Oh, they went home and they just cried. Isn't that a blessing? Went home and just murmured and complained and cried about what? About what took place in the preceding chapter. God brought them up there, told them to pick out spies and spies in. Friend, they came back out. Oh, but they had one cluster of grapes on a pole between two men. That means one man couldn't carry them. Most men couldn't carry 150, 200 pound boats. And they, they, they couldn't carry these. That tells you the magnitude of, of that. Uh, one cluster of grapes from the valley of Eskol. Uh, the, the word Eskol in the Bible means cluster. And they got that, with it, they brought those out. But I'm talking about, they came out and said, it's everything God said it was. Huh? The land flowing with milk and honey and butt. And boy, they threw that butt in there. They said there are giants in the land. There are cities that are walled up to the sky. Uh, they said, we're hey, we look like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and therefore we look like grasshoppers in their eyes. Now, you remember, we, we took a look at what the Canaanites were looking for. And you go to Rahab in the book of Joshua. She said, from the time God dried up that Red Sea, they were trembling in their shoes. These giants and everybody else, because the God of Israel dried up the sea and brought Israel through on dry land and drowned the most powerful army in the world in that sea. God just took care of them. No big deal with God. And boy, they were trembling. So what they did, they saw themselves as grasshoppers, but the giants saw them as giants because they had a big God. So what they did was they just fell apart, all right? So what they did all that night, they just sat around and talked about those giants and the big cities and all that. You know, old Caleb and Joshua, Caleb told them, hey, we go in and take it. It belonged to us. We can take that thing. Hey, we, we go in. God said he'd give it to us. If God said we can have it, then we can have it. So they began to cry and weep. Now notice in verse number 2, chapter 14, and all the children of Israel, again, they're in, hey, all the congregation, all, if they are in one accord, they're, they're, they're all on the same page. They're just in the wrong book. But they said they murmur, murmured one against Moses and against Aaron. Now, they did the same thing about God. What they did was they took out their fear on somebody that was human. I've often told people, you let you keep people's sin between them and God. If it, if, if it becomes, if you want to argue with them, 
that it becomes between you and them and they can hold where they stand and be completely out of the word of God. But if you make them argue with God, you don't argue with God. Scripture is not arguable. It is authoritative, all right? So what happened was they took it out on Moses. Moses caught a lot of flack. Uh, Moses was a good man of God. Moses had taken care of them. Uh, Moses had fed them. He put up with their bad manners. But they murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, now here's what they said, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt. Would God he would have allowed them to. Boy, that God's graciousness, he brought them out. <clears throat> he heard the cry, the reason of their taskmaster. The, over the book of Exodus, you find that God, when he called Moses up to the burning bush, he said, I heard your cries. Crying out to God for deliverance. And God delivered them. And these very people right here saw what God did in Egypt. They saw what God did in the Red Sea. They saw what God did with the manna, with the quail, and with everything else. They've seen the power of God. And yet they took the voice of man over God. You've got to be careful with what you listen to and who you listen to. If anybody thinks they're smarter than the Bible, then you turn them off. They're Bible crackers, just turn them off. Just flip, flip that switch, do whatever you need to do, just flip that thing off. Why? Because when man says one thing and God says the other one, we know that God said that every man be a liar. Let God be true, but every man a liar. Now, what's he talking about? If, if they say something against the true God, they're liars. So what they did were, they were listening to the liars. Who were the liars? The liars were these 10 spies that came back and they said, there's no way we can take that. And Caleb said, hey, we got this thing, all right? Let's just, just take this thing. We'll march in there, we'll whoop everybody, we'll take over, and we got out of the land flowing with milk and honey. They said, would God we die in the land of Egypt, or would God we die in this wilderness? Uh-oh. Now they're going to get their wish. Would to God we died in this wilderness. When God gets done with them, everyone except these that were under the age of not just uh, age-wise accountability, but uh, these that had nothing to do with this, all right, their children and all of them, they would grow up and be able to go in. Uh, we find that Joshua and Caleb would get to go in. So you've got those two plus all of these, but they, they did the same thing Israel did when Israel, uh, talking about Christ, said, let his blood be upon us and our children. That blood's still on Israel. Even though it's God's beloved nation today, they are blinded when it comes to the New Testament and the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a veil over their hearts, and they prayed that judgment down upon themselves in 2,000 years they had to live with. Now, notice what they said. Would to God we had died in the wilderness. Verse 3, And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land? Why did God bring us here? Well, you wanted out of Egypt. Isn't that simple? Huh? They were asking God to deliver them. Their father was Abraham. God gave that land to Abraham. He told him every every place the sole of your foot has touched. You say, where is that from? That's when he crossed the Euphrates River to the north out of Turan. When he came there and left there, after, after a certain length of time, he brought them out, and when they came across that Euphrates all the way down, I'm talking about down to the Dead Sea, he also, they also went into the Negev Desert down below it, he also got to go all the way to the Nile River. All of that land belongs to them. That'll be Israel's homeland. So he said, why'd you bring us to this land? You know, it's interesting. I find that as soon as God brought them out of uh, where they were, out of the city of their bondage, hey, that, that land where they were crossing was going to belong to them anyway. But he said, 
to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey. Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? They said, we're just going to go back where we came from. We've got a lot of people that get saved that try to go back where you come from. Let me tell you, that's a dangerous thing, all right? They don't say God will always give you what you want. It'll always cost you what you've got. There'll be a price tag. God said, all right, you want to go? You want to die in the wilderness? We're going to let you die in the wilderness. We're going to take you right back in there, and you're just going to wander around and around and around in there for 40 years until that generation is dead. So they said in verse 4, they said one to another, listen, make a captain. That's what Israel did once again. When God delivered them, uh, Samuel was a high priest, and God delivered them, and they set up a stone and called it Ebenezer. That word Ebenezer means hitherto the Lord had helped us. So they gave God the glory for the victory, and in the next breath, they said, now we want a king like the other people. Samuel got hot about that. God, hey, they were under what's called a theocracy. That's a rule by God, and that's the perfect place for you to be under a theocracy. So what happened was they said, just make us a king and we'll be satisfied. And old Samuel came to God and complained a little bit. God said, Samuel, he said, they not rejected you. He said, they rejected me. When they said, let us make a captain, God had set Moses in place. He had set the Aaronic priesthood in place. He had set the Levitical priesthood in place. They had a tabernacle built, everything else. And they said, we're just going to get us a man to lead us back to where we came from. And that's where we're going to go. We're going to go to Egypt. Verse 5, then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation and of the children of Israel. Boy, God's men just fell on their face. I mean, if, boy, you're talking about struck down with what they were saying. Uh, Moses and Aaron understood the ramifications of that. Verse number six, and Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. Now, in, in the Old Testament times, uh, people would uh, rend their clothes, they would tear their clothes, they would dress in sackcloth, ashes on their head, a uh, type of very uh, fervent mourning. Uh, these two men mourned because they knew what God said. God gave it to them. Indeed, they could take it, but they were in a vast minority. Only three people rejected, uh, or four, so, but uh, you take, I'm sure Moses and Abram did also. But if you're talking about millions of people are against you, you're going to be by yourself. And so they fell on their face in, in front of the people. And he said in verse 7, They spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. Boy, what a land. I, I, I like to watch uh, different things about Israel. If you look at it, that's one of the most beautiful lands in the world over there. Just absolutely gorgeous land. Uh, tremendous land. And they said it's an exceeding uh, good land. Verse number eight, and if the Lord delight in us, what's he going to delight in? He's not delighting in what they're doing. God taketh no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God doesn't take pleasure in that, but he also does not delight in the foolishness of men. When men think they're smarter than God or they can preempt what God said and do something better way and make that thing work out. It doesn't please God. A lot of people do that. Uh, they hear what the Bible says, you can preach it, you can teach it, or whatever, and they're going to do their own thing anyway. Right? They just say, our, our way is better than your way, Lord. I know what you've said, but you know, you'll get over that, I'm sure. Uh, we're just going to do it our way. I call it Frank Sinatra syndrome. I mean, he did it. Uh, my way, all right? So they, they said, hey, if the Lord delight in us, then he'll bring us into this land and give it us. A land which floweth with milk and honey. He said, all we've got to do is get right with God and go in, and God is going to give it to us. Now, we're going to have to fight for it. They understood that, and they were full well ready to do that. I mean, he, boy, he had an army of 600 and something thousand men 
Now, I had a, had a mighty army and God on their side, and he said, God give it to us, and clothed with milk and honey. Verse 9, only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land. One, don't rebel against God. Then the Bible said we're not to fear what men can do to us. He said, if you're going to fear somebody, fear God. He said, man can kill your body. But God can kill body and soul in hell. God can do a, abundantly above that. First thing he said was, you need to fear God. If you don't fear God, and I believe the root of the problem in our land and has been for many years is a lack of fear of God. People no longer fear God. Oh, they say, I believe in God. But they have no fear of God. Uh, fear of God is what caused one thief to be saved and one to remain lost uh, on that cross. And that thief that got saved, he looked over at the other one and he said, Dost thou not fear God? He asked him a question. Do you fear God? If you don't fear God, one, you're not going to get saved. Stop it. I think a lot of people today have just got a little bit of religion tied up. They don't have anything that has been a, a life-altering event that takes place called salvation. But he said in here, he said, they rebel not against the Lord, then neither fear ye the people of the land. Giants. We talked about Og last week. The only man in the Bible that it gives the size of his bed his bed was 13 feet long and 6 feet wide. They built the bed for the man. They didn't have the double, the king size, and the triple size, and all this stuff. You know, you think years ago, people had smaller beds. Uh, I, I'm not a big king size, but we go at Barbara we like to get a king size suite, and we do that, and I don't get to see her for three days. <laughs> I can't find it. All right. And I, I look over there. I look for the biggest pile of covers on the bed, and she's normally on the bed or someplace. I don't, I don't like it. Queen size is good. I mean, you got enough room to turn around and whatever. You can put your foot over there and you make sure you know they're there and living and breathing and still warm and, and all that type of stuff. They made the bed for the people. So Ob was probably about 12 feet tall and 5 feet wide. I'm talking about you 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 think your grand young is a big. <laughs> I mean that I saw a picture of Stephen with his wife, you know, Stephen's short, you know, and uh, she come back to right here on Stephen standing there. He, he looked like Og <laughs> standing beside of her. Hey, these these giants, he said, don't fear them. David did not fear the lion. He told him he blasphemed the name of God. And he said, ah. He said, I'll cut your head off and give it to the fowls of the air. And he was a young man at that particular time. So he said, don't rebel against the Lord. Don't fear the land, for they are bread for us. I, I like that phrase in verse number nine. They're bread for us. What do you do with bread? You eat it up, right? He said, they're like bread for us. He said, we'll eat them alive when we go in there is what he was talking about. He said we'll take them to the ground. We will destroy them completely. We'll digest them and spit them out. Uh, I thought it was interesting. He said they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them. Now the walls are still there. But the first city that they go into is Jericho. Israel did not breach the walls. God took them down flat. God took the wall. He showed them something about the walls. The walls were essential to these. Most of these were what you call city states. Even though they had people that were the same people around about that thing. Well, they had huge fortresses. Uh, you go back to the days of Israel. Israel had a, a wall around the old city there. I mean, they... What they did was people lived in the city, people lived outside of the city. At the first time of alarm, everybody came into the city, they shut the gates. These things were huge walls. It was hard to climb. Uh, they talk about putting a 30-foot wall down at, uh, on the border. And, and by the way, they need a wall from one end to the other. It's the only way they're going to control the situation. That's why they're fighting the walls. They don't want to control it. But you put it up. 
But 30 feet ain't high enough. They need to put one up about 75 to 100 feet up there. And uh, every day go out there and grease it. Uh, just spray some WD-40 or something on it. <laughs> hey, that's why I keep squirrels from climbing up to get to my bird feeders. I've, I've got them on a, a piece of metal pipe about that big around, and I keep Vaseline. <laughs> and every time the uh, coons and things and squirrels get to try to activate, I just put Vaseline over. They get up there and you can see what they went. I saw a picture where somebody put a slinky on one. You know what a slinky is? Show that old squirrel, and they got the playing on them. You know, squirrels play on them. They find something like that. It keeps them getting the bird seed, but it gives them a little recreation in the meantime. You can do a lot of things with squirrels. He said their defenses, notice what he said, it departed from them. Though the walls were still up, he said God's already got them down for them. When you come to them, God will take them down. I found out a long time ago, be careful about your worry. Most of our worries never come to fruition. You ever notice that? You worry about something, you look for that day, you hate that day, and all of a sudden you're on the other side the next day and think, that wasn't that bad. You know, it, it turned out a whole lot better than I thought. If you learn to trust God with your tomorrows that you can't change, these are things that you can't change, you have no control, just trust God with them, you'll find out when they come and when they go that God will handle them for you, and it makes it a whole lot easier on it. I thank God for that sign out on my deck. It is what it is. That means it's going to be, and I can't do anything about it. So I'm not going to sit out there on the porch and cry about it. I'm not going to sit out there and fret. I'm not going to get my nerves all tore up about it. We're just going to pray about it. Uh, Barbara and I will pray about it, and then we'll just face it the next day or whenever and just pick it up and go and do what we need to do. And that's what he's talking about here. He said, their defense is departed, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Boy, that should have settled it, right? Now notice the next word in verse 10, but. But always draws a contrast. I like people, they say, well, you've got a nice pastor, good man, but. Oh, when they throw that but out there, uh, they're going to tell you something you don't really want to hear. You want to stay away from it. And by the way, pray for Carl and Tammy. Uh, Carl got a new pacemaker put in, took care of his problem. All right, he's had that for a year, so he's doing well at home. Uh, we prayed for him while ago, but I just want you to understand where he was. But anyway, uh, he, he just talked about, hey, they, they, but all the congregation made stone them with stones. When they said this, now, this is not God talking. This is Moses and Joshua and Caleb doing the talking here. They're just, they're going to stone them. You know, people, especially religious people, have always hated God's man. I'm going to get the privilege to preach Tuesday night up at the Bible college up there, the chapel up there, and I, and I thank God for that. I, I thank God we've got some new uh, recruits are coming along up there. Amen. Thank the Lord for uh, some young families, some young people up there, and, and I've been oh, I've been all over the map about where we want to preach to them. You know, I've got 25 minutes if I need it or not. They said unless it gets out of the banks. I have never had my preaching get anybody out of the banks. <laughs> all right. uh, my preaching just does not get them shouting and screaming and running and hollering. And I told them, I said, that 25 minutes will be all I need. So I'm going to set me a little timer and I'm going to let that thing start kicking her down and uh, stay within my limit. I found out a long time ago, if they give you 25 minutes, preach for 22 minutes and give them the change. And make sure you do it right. I've seen preachers that give you 25 minutes. I, they think God is really in that thing. I mean, oh, they, they get to preaching in a big way and they go 30 or 40 minutes or something like that. And I see people looking at their watches. You know why? They, you, I don't care what you're preaching, you've lost them. They know that you had 25 minutes. You're taking 35 or 40. You're not obedient to the power that's over you at that point in time. And the minute that you do that, you have lost them. All right. Now, once you notice, they said, but all the congregation made them. They, they, they've always hated God's men. Stoned them with stones. 
killed. We're going to make a captain. We're going to take those that God appointed. And we're going to get them out of the way. And we're going to get the ones that man has appointed and put them in their place. And he said, then God did something. The word and in verse 10, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. God stopped it. God let them go to a degree. There's a time when God will put a stop to it. God will do that. Boy, I'll tell you what, you don't want God to have to stop something that you need to stop yourself because God is fully able to do that. Uh, a lot of times, you know, God gives us these little warnings and, you know, you hear the preacher or you read a verse of scripture or that small, still small voice speaks to your heart and you keep ignoring that thing and going on. Eventually, the Bible said, for this cause many are sickly among you and they sleep. God will correct. Now, God would not let them throw a stone at Moses. He wouldn't let them throw a stone at Abram because these were God's men that God put in their place. So now, the cloud of God, boy, it set down in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. I don't think they're standing and complaining at the tabernacle. Remember, the tabernacle was in the middle of the camp. And then there's what we use, bad term, uh, any kind of military camp in hostile area, they, they make what's called a kill zone. They kill all of the vegetation and everything. That's why the agent arms and stuff over in Vietnam, they do, they clear a place to where nobody can slip up on them, all right? Well, they had that clear place, and I don't think they were anywhere close. I think the, tab the congregation got together out here, and they looked at that tabernacle that everybody's ignoring, and they saw God sit down at the tabernacle. When God sat down, things began to rapidly change. And the Lord said unto Moses, God's still not saying anything to this crowd. Why? He's got a mediator. There's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. That's why we have to go to God through Christ. We don't just go to God any way we want to. We go to God through Christ. There's mediation to be done. So the Lord sat down and said, How long will this people provoke me? When you're provoking somebody, you know, the Bible says not to provoke to wrath. What is wrath? Wrath is anger that is no longer controlled, or it is controlled, but it becomes destructive in its nature. That's why the Bible said, be angry and sin not. The Bible said that the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. When man loses control of his temper, he's in trouble. You lose control of your temper, you get out of the will of God at the snap of a finger when you do that. Anger has to be properly directed and properly controlled. We've got to do that. that. There ought to be things that make you and I angry in this life. I see things I don't, I don't like. We're about out of time. I see things that I don't like. But wrath is when you take that into your own hands. The Lord said, Vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord, I will repay. So he's telling Moses, they're not going to stone you. But they're not going to provoke me either. The minute they provoke me, they're in trouble. So we find they're in trouble because, listen, the land was theirs. All they had to do was go in and get it. Hey, it had been over within a couple of months or whatever, and they would have enjoyed that land for the rest of their lives, and the enemies would have been gone, and the milk and honey would have belonged to them along with the grapes. Let's have words of our Father. We love you. We thank you, Lord, for the day. We thank you for the goodness of God. Thank you for the word of God. Lord, every word is important. That's why I do not believe we have a right to change one of them, to leave one out, or add one to it. I thank you, Lord, for it. I pray you bless our people that are not able to be here today. Give us a good day. And Lord, we sure love you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, one of the prayers.